topic for this session really is about hybrid models of care. Um, and what do we mean by that? Well, of course, we've all had the most extraordinary 15 months nearly now, uh, 14 months. And we've seen a lot of changes in the way we've used technology in particular to deliver health and care services. We've seen changes in the demand for access and we've seen changes in the way we can scale up services that were already in place. So we've definitely seen an expansion of the use of certain types of technology in certain settings to provide care and access to care. But what does that really mean for the longer term? Are we really truly seeing a shift? I think we probably have a lot of enthusiasts on the call today <laughs> and people who want to see the change if it's a positive change to happen. But are we really seeing a shift where we're developing new models of care or hybrid care? where we have a more blended approach, where we have face-to-face -face or in-person encounters with our health and care professionals, but we also have the opportunity to use the technology where we don't need to have a face-to-face -face encounter or to increase access and provision and equity of access to services. So there's a lot to discuss about the way the models of care are developing and can be developed in a way that provides governance and security and safety for all provided. So the hybrid model is a really interesting one. And the first person we have up to speak is, I'm pleased to say, from Scotland, one of my colleagues. He is Mark Bezik. And Mark is the National Near Me Network Lead for Scotland. And in Scotland, in Scottish terms, Near Me refers to video consultation and the use of video consultation. So Mark is going to explain to us about how the service has been developing. It's been around for a while, pre-COVID, but how the impact of COVID has really impacted that change. And then we move across the world and we have a presentation from Professor Ganapathy. Professor Ganapathy from the Apollo Medicine Teleworking Foundation in India, who has an amazing experience and really the scale of provision is something that we all, <laughs> makes us all feel very ambitious and perhaps jealous. Um, so a lot to learn from one another, I think. So just as context, uh, we're working here as part of Imagining 2029, which is our current uh, program of work. Right there, jam bang in the middle, is hybrid care, um, mainstreaming, mainstreaming virtual care with new models of care. And you can see some of the projects that we're working with collectively, some of the things we do like produce white papers, fact sheets, consultations, and uh, really then the kind of topics and types of services that we're relying on. We did some really useful work last year in 2020, and we've got at least six fact sheets that you can rely upon for information and detail. The one I've got there is hospitalization at home, which seemed to me probably to be the most relevant to today's meeting and the website indeed. And we are drawing on previous meetings with colleagues uh, so Mark and uh, Krishnam, Professor Ganapati, this is, is background for you. Uh, the, the work that's been done on the hybrid patient journey uh, by CUF in Portugal uh, and presented to us on one occasion by Michaela Simon Montero. You can see uh, the waves. Uh, we hope there are no waves today. Um, but bringing together remote and on site, as well as bringing together everything that's digital and everything that's human. And the next slide, uh, and at the same time, I'm sending uh, apologies on, on the part of Mete Atape Craggs, our ETEL board member, but Mete has sent us this stepwise approach to coming to hybrid care. Uh, the, alt, the top step is blended care. So it's a digital step care approach to blended care or hybrid care. Um, in Denmark, they operate that in relation to people uh, with mental health um, challenges and the, the, they themselves are based in a center for telepsychiatry. Next, please, Mark. Uh, three main areas of 
exploration. We think that today is mostly really going to focus on the organizational side, but I'm pretty sure with the health and care professionals with us, clinical issues will come up and our industrialists and commercial people will probably bring up the technical challenges. Both presenters will be focusing on video conferencing. Uh, probably the last three specific goals, bit of compare and contrast. Um, really, this is about awareness raising, and we'll be going into this topic surely far more in far more detail. Great. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me here this afternoon uh, <clears throat> to meet with you all and, and share with you what we've been doing uh, in Scotland. Um, I'm an occupational therapist uh, by trade, and prior to my current role uh, in the Scottish Government, I was uh, providing occupational therapy for children and families uh, in a little island halfway between Scotland and Norway. So it's uh, it's called Shetland, uh, 22,000 people there, and we were providing uh, occupational therapy for children and families to a, an island community that is 12 hours overnight by ferry back to mainland Scotland, or about an hour and a half's flight. So we used Near Me as a, a means of providing services to families within the islands, because it's a very remote place, but also onto the mainland as well. So I'm gonna do a little bit of an introduction about what Near Me is and the progress over the past year, how we've used um, Near Me to improve efficiency, accessibility, and the quality of healthcare in Scotland, and also how we've used quality improvement projects particularly in urgent care. So we're going to just pick one element of our work over the last 12 months. We're going to look at what the outcomes were to that work. What was the impact we had on people's health and well-being, and on, on, on their um, experiences of minor injuries in urgent care. And then we'll look at some uh, uh, outcomes and then, and then look at some scenarios and discussion afterwards with, with people. So we're looking forward to, to engaging with you on that front as well. So now I'm going to just speak a little bit more about Near Me, because Near Me might be something that, that you in the audience um, have perhaps come across before. So it is a video consulting service. It uses a software platform from Australia called Attend Anywhere. So some people may have heard of Attend Anywhere, but in, in Scotland, the, the public chose Near Me as the name they would like to have for their, their platform they use for video conferencing with their professionals. It's web-based and it's available to the whole of the public sector across Scotland now, not just within health. And we're looking to make sure that this choice is a choice for everybody as we return and recover back to services as business as usual. It's a freestanding web-based system, so you don't have to download anything, you don't have to log in and make an account. You just come into the, your appointment, put your name and the date of birth in perhaps, and then you join the consultation with your professional. All you need is a web camera and a microphone uh, and or headset and speakers. So it's a very simple, patient-centered, user-friendly system that is very nice and easy for people of, of all abilities to, to, to engage with and join. Um, it initially started in Scotland in around 2016. There was a, a scale-up project in 2019, and then COVID came along, and uh, we had to rapidly scale up the use of Near Me across Scotland. So we managed to go from around 300 consultations a week in March 2020, and we averaged 22 to 24,000 a week now. So there's been a significant uh, jump in that, and I'll show you a graph to do with that later on. So my role in all of this initially was to support both patients and staff in this remote island in the middle of the ocean as how to use video conferencing to continue their services in the middle of a pandemic. We then developed digital tools to try and share that with the wider professions across Scotland. And then we ran webinars where we, 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 a bit like this, where we shared what Near Me can do for professions across Scotland. So we've had a, um, a very rapid, um, focused, intense time, making sure that Near Me is available for um, the people of Scotland. So if, if you could go to the slide with a graph on it, um, that one there. So that shows you where we were in March, uh, you know, Zero is March 2020, and there's a few drops there around um, holiday periods. But as you can see, it was a very rapid and sustained um, uh, increase in near me use. 
So now we're going to focus on one element of our improvement projects. This is urgent care. So we're looking to seek trans significant transformational change, how urgent care is delivered to the people of Scotland. So the basic premise is it's the right person at the right place at the right time. Um, and that was the pure essence of, of re re designing urgent care. Right, right place, right person, right time. So in order to facilitate that, if you can go to the next slide, please, Mark. Where does near me sit? Where does near me sit in the hybrid model that we're here to kind of speak about today? So we, yes, we have telephone as a first line to, re to reduce infection spread. If you're phoning urgent care or accident and emergency or minor injuries, you might phone them first. I've hurt myself, I've injured myself. Um, then you might want to look at, okay, how do we get more information? How can we reassure patients they're gonna be okay without physically actually getting them in the building? And we would use a near me call. We'd have a video call with them. We can see them, they can see us. And, and, it, and it goes a long way in, in reassuring that patient that they're gonna be okay. And if that patient does need face-to-face -face or needs something specifically examining, then yes, that's when face-to-face -face is gonna be brought in. So you, you see the beginnings of this hybrid model. What's the option that's gonna work for that patient with that clinician in that urgent care environment, in that unscheduled, I've, I've injured myself, uh, what help do I need? So if we then look at what we did next, we then looked at the quality improvement processes. So the next slide talks about the process we go through. This is the one that might need a little bit of zooming. Um, so we did, we did these rapid improvement projects throughout the whole of last year with multiple sectors. And we're just going to focus on minor injuries today. So basically, we had a kickoff meeting planning what we're going to be doing. We did lots of testing and improvement, rapid cycles of change, tests of change. Um, and out of that came, we supported departments and, and areas to, to go through these rapid tests of change, to get the processes right, to get safe practice in place, to get all their um, procedures in place. And then we produced outputs. So we produced statistics, we produced data, but we also produced documents that could be shared with wider um, elements of, the, of um, the workforce. And all this happened within a four week period. We also had lots of group learning, lots of handholding, lots of experiential learning with departments. And we ran webinars as well, like we're doing now, where we shared, we've done this in a four week cycle, quality improvement, rapid tests of change, here are the outcomes, here's some data, and here's some procedures to help you. So that was um, some minor injuries units that carried on with that. And I'll show you some of the project work they did in a few minutes. So the next slide is basically now looking at NHS Lothian. So this is the health board that's based in and around Edinburgh, the capital city of Scotland. So call MIA, so MIA is minor injuries assessment. And this was what um, they were kind of marketed as in terms of the public message that was talked out. So they looked at their process measures, how many calls, how many video consultations were generated from those calls, how many patients um, ended up representing at minor injuries and urgent care. And out of those, who had had a video and who hadn't? And also, you know, who was coming back? Where were they going to next? And also they wanted to measure, did they go to community care? Did they look at self-care, self-management? And they also wanted to gather some patient feedback. What was the experience like for people having video calls instead of working or going to the minor injuries units or the urgent care units? And what did the staff feel about that? How did staff feel about making clinical judgments based on a video rather than actually physically touching or seeing somebody? So they very much wanted to reduce variation, but also the, one of the biggest pressures last year was to reduce footfall in urgent care. Traditionally, people appear at A&E in urgent care expecting to be helped. And we couldn't have all these people in A&E wanting to be helped. We had to find a way of turning unscheduled people appearing into something scheduled, managed in a workflow. So this is how we piloted it in East Lothian. So this, this it might be quite hard to see for you on the next slide. There's actually a patient flow diagram there, Mark, if you can pop that one up. So, for example, you might call uh, 111, which is our uh, telephone service in Scotland. You would go through some triage, but you may be triaged to say, actually, you need, you need to go to the emergency department. Please go now. Or actually, the kind of things you're telling us about, 
let, let's put you through to a flow navigation centre and let's have a conversation with you about whether you need to go to minor injuries, whether you need to be um, seen by video or face to face or a phone call. So the next part of that, that flow chart talks about can the patient use near me? Do they have the technology? Do they have the abilities? And if they do have that near me ability, then let's schedule a near me appointment for you. So then you can have a conversation with a healthcare professional, whether that is a, an emergency nurse practitioner or a doctor or, or a triage specialist. Um, so they would have these near me uh, video calls and that would often result in a number of options. So the person might be giving some self-care advice. They might be scheduled to appointment at the emergency department. So don't come now, come in an hour's time or come at 3.45. Um, they might have something that can be sorted out at minor injuries, but they also might need to be linked into community service, like a, a mental health service, for example, or they might need to be referred to another hospital service, perhaps dentistry or podiatry. So this flow navigation really controlled the traffic that was coming in and out of urgent care, minor injuries, emergency departments, and people were, were um, directed to the right place that... Um, met their needs on that day. So that gives you a little flavor of, of, of the kind of flow that was set up within these test pilot sites. So basically after a three month review, uh, 571 patients had used Call Mia, uh, but 45% had an outcome of self or community care. So that's nearly half didn't actually need to go to minor injuries or emergency. So that's, so that's a huge amount of footfall that's been reduced. Um, and fantastic, and and, and um, there'd been a forty-one percent reduction in attendance at hospital after three months. So that's a, a huge amount of people that were just appearing at hospital wanting help. So so you managed to you know the patient flow uh, uh, had really had a massive impact on that. So that's just one bit of data from one pilot scheme in one area. So um, yeah, one thousand eight hundred and sixty-six patients had used the Call Mia service. In, in the in the test pilot uh, area, um, and and we we talked about patient satisfaction. How happy were they to to get that that day? And they were very satisfied. Um, the, the the project demonstrated it reduced footfall. It resulted in safe clinical decision making. It reduced unnecessary travel and it increased self management. So forty one percent of people had the near me call were given self management and did not need to enter urgent care. And our representation rate has been about 7%. And most of those people who represented either had a worsening um, uh, condition, which is what they're told to do. If you worsen, please come in. But the ones that represented got the same advice as they did when they first appeared. So, you know, there was some confidence then that, that we were giving good people good information. We're now looking at using it in citizens' advice. Housing associations are using it for students. We're about to start testing using it with groups. We've used it in social care settings for care home reviews, and we're really expanding our, our range within uh, primary care as well. So again, same kind of process, quality improvement approach, tests of change, really getting good data and, and good, good solid evidence that, that we're having an impact here. So um, I noticed there's quite a lot of uh, comments uh, in the thing, so I think hopefully we'll pick these up later, but I'm um, really pleased to see people from, uh, all over the place um, from Greece and Italy and the Netherlands. So thank you very much for putting your, your, your names and, and um, where you're from now. That's really helpful to see looking at the breadth of people in, in different parts of, of Europe and beyond and different roles as well. It's very interesting. So thank you for that. Um, I'm very happy to take comments and questions uh, at the end. I will put in um, some links to near me within the chat uh, more around um, the, the, the tech website and, and the where to get the information from. Um, and I think that's probably all I want to share for now. So, but I'm happy to pick up any themes or questions a bit later on. And thank you very much for listening and engaging with the chat. Thank you, Mark. Um, thanks very much. Really interesting presentation. And to see the scale of change and the expansion also out into um, some non-health and other, other related areas. I'm just going to hand directly over to Professor Ganapathy from the Apollo Medicine Teleworking Foundation in India, where, although, as I said earlier, I'm sure the scale is very, very significantly different. I wonder if we will have some similar 
similar learning or similar challenges. Uh, Professor Ganapathy, over to you. Thank you. 900 seconds is absolutely impossible to tell you what we have done in the last 21 years. And we have now done, as you can see from this map of India, 13 million teleconsultations. We have now reached almost 10,000 teleconsultations per day. 90% of this is through public-private partnerships with various state governments and some agencies from the government of India. These are spread all over the country. We started with the Himalayas, the government of Himachal Pradesh, and recently we have published a chapter in a European-based textbook, a 33-page chapter where I have described in great detail what exactly we have done. And we, in this paper, for the first time, to the best of our knowledge, we proved that from an economic point of view, it makes sense to invest in a public-private partnership. The message of several of our publications is the only way to bridge the urban-rural health divide, which is present not only in India, but even in the so-called advanced countries of the world, is public-private partnership, and I will show you some illustrative examples. Now, these pilot projects which we are doing, proof of concept validation, they're more or less the pilot phase is over and we're ready to integrate it into the healthcare delivery system of the country. This is the largest state in India, Uttar Pradesh, a population of 240 million, half the size of Europe. This is the largest state in the country. In this particular project, as you can see, it is entirely digital healthcare. I won't say it is totally paperless, but 90% of it is digital. We have, a, we have extremely transparent. We have a dashboard, which obviously is accessible only to authorized persons. But as you can see from this, just one screenshot, this dashboard is updated in real time. This is one of the most backward states of India called Jharkhand in the northwestern part of the country. And here again, you can see laboratory investigations alone have been 224,000 laboratory investigations. And these have been updated in real time. The panel in the middle, if you look carefully, the cumulative teleconsultations were half a million. And today, that is on the 11th May, that is just about a week ago, in spite of the lockdown in many of these states, etc., 270 teleconsultations were done even during the pandemic period on that particular day. This, I'm almost certain, is the world's largest teleophthalmology project. 1.6 million people, their eyes have been seen not by a local doctor. This is a true example of hybrid care. I like the word hybrid, which you are using. And honestly, I was not aware of this word hybrid at all, in spite of my fair familiarity with the literature. In this particular project, 115 eye centers, which belong to the government of Telangana, which is in southern India, were handed over to a corporate hospital, of course, through a tender. This is public money, so we won the tender. We took over these 115 centers, which were in a rather dilapidated state, and then refurbished them completely. I have 30, 30, 30 ophthalmologists in Chennai, Madras, where I live, which is about 380 kilometers away from these villages. And my 30 doctors with state-of-the-art iPads and tablets, etc., in 10 minutes, in less than 600 seconds, a report is given, as you can see in this slide. We have so far examined 450,000, half a million fundus examinations have been done with a turnaround time. Average turnaround time is 25 minutes, most of them in 15 minutes. As you can see here, a computer-generated report we have just started using artificial intelligence for some of them. Of course, a human being still goes through it. The initial, this is a, still a small pilot project where we have teamed up with uh, Aravind Eye Hospital and Google. And hopefully in a year or so, we will have enough information to confirm the use of AI in the evaluation of retinopathy. So the patient who does not pay anything for it, he gets a color printout 
within 20 minutes, 25 minutes in a village in the suburbs of the state where he lives. And this is seen by a very well experienced qualified ophthalmologist. This is another of our very major public-private partnership projects where we run 183 primary health centers. To those of you who have some idea of India, India has 640 districts and about 39,000 primary health centers, which is at the bottom of the pyramid. Even during the lockdown period, partial lockdown, emergency services, of course, that is not a complete lockdown. In April, when the second wave, which you see now, has started, we were able to do 205,000 consultations. And a total number of specialist teleconsultations has reached 1.1 million specialist teleconsultations. It's a matter of great pride for me. I don't think anywhere in the world will a, a, a neurologist, an orthopedic surgeon, an obstetrician, an endocrinologist, you name it, a specialist and a super specialist appears on a giant screen within three to four hours. We run virtual OPs every day of the week in various specialities, and truly it's hybrid. We have an MBBS doctor, a, 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 a family physician who consults a telespecialist, and this is what we mean by a hybrid consultation. I'm just giving you one single example to show you the effect of what we actually do. This was in the Himalayas at a height of 14,800 feet. It was in December. The temperature was minus 25 degrees centigrade. For five months, this particular district is totally cut off from the rest of the world because of landslides. It was impossible for the government to get medical doctors to live there, even though they were offered a salary of four times what the government normally pays. So we installed the telemedicine units. I have a wonderful staff of paramedics and nurses, no doctor. I repeat, we have no doctor in these telemedicine units, but very well-trained nurses. So this 65-year-old man came with chest pain. Again, we belong to the old generation of doctors. We believe in clinical, clinical, clinical judgment. And though the first ECG was normal, my doctor, a very smart young emergency ER guy, he said, I just don't like the look of this guy. He doesn't look well to me. Don't send him back. Repeat the ECG after 45 minutes. And lo and behold, the second ECG confirmed the clinical suspicion of an impending myocardial infarction. A diagnosis of myocardial infarction was made 2,800 miles away, even as the infarction was evolving. Needless to say, we initiated thrombolysis. Today, we have done at least, we have treated at least 20 patients in the last five years with where myocardial infarctions were picked up as they were evolving. I could give hundreds of clinical examples, but then I have a shortage of time here. Now, what makes our hybrid care totally unique? The EUPHC, the symbol E is obviously electronic. We are the first digital primary healthcare centers in India. And I strongly believe that the future of healthcare is not diagnosis and treatment, but promoting wellness, the E way. We believe that keeping healthy will be people healthy, will be the primary goal of doctors. 99% of open heart surgeries which are being done today could perhaps have been prevented if only lifestyle care attention had been paid in the beginning. So this is what, ladies and gentlemen, we are using. Innovations at the highest, resource utilization, and of course, we are uh, the quality control. We are obsessed with quality control, quality management and improvement. In this particular project, we have 640 laboratories where quality control is evaluated remotely. We have published papers on this. All our laboratories are ISO certified, as well as NABH, National Accreditation, NABL, the Board of Laboratories are all certified. And every day, by turns, of course, these laboratories' quality control is remotely evaluated by experts from the city of Hyderabad. Now, we... This is, these photographs, of course, are before the COVID, but we hope that eventually we will resume this. We very strongly believe that patient empowerment, knowledge empowerment. Actually, I picked up this from Sir Muir Gray, the chief knowledge, the then chief knowledge officer of NHS, 
I had the opportunity of meeting him and also Lord Nigel Chris, who was the CEO of NHS. And that was a great experience for me when I was in Oxford for some time. And I picked it up from him and he convinced me that knowledge empowerment, patient empowerment is much more important than antibiotics and ECG. So following in his footsteps, we do this. And today, about 45,000 people all over India have attended our lectures in the local language. We talk to them about headache, back pain, diabetes, blood pressure, and so on and so forth. This is hybrid in the real sense of the term. You can see on the left-hand side, uh, the, the two children with their mother, and you can see my staff uh, entering all the data in an EMR by a paramedic. And on the right-hand side, you can see my doctor in our hospital, Incidentally, we run the world's largest, India's largest medical response center. I have 250 desks where we have people round the clock sitting there. Most of them are doctors, but a small percentage are nurses, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, etc., who do some moonlighting outside their working hours, get earn some money and help us also. So here you can see the pharmacy. They pick up all the drugs within 60 minutes. Laboratory, our laboratories are all connected to an EMR and a hospital information system. And we guarantee that any test, we run at least about 70 different laboratory tests. Within two hours, the patient has to wait for two hours, depending on the complexity of the test, and he gets the report then and there. He does not have to come back again. Again, in a paper which we have recently published, we showed that the laboratory test in a public-private partnership is only 29% of that in private laboratories. Again, we are able to give 70% more tests in a PPP mode than is available either in a government mode or even in a private hospital. And again, the costing, of course, you can see for yourselves, the actual cost incurred is significantly less. I would like to spend the last two, three minutes on how digital healthcare, hybrid care has totally changed because of the pandemic. But unfortunately, and I feel very strongly about this, the media, presumably the international media as well, only talk about the lack of oxygen, the lack of beds, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, it is true. Every sixth human on planet Earth lives in India, and certainly it is going to take time for us to cope up with it. But what is absolutely amazing is the Apollo Telemedicine Center. I have a fantastic staff, and here you can see within 10 days, we set up all this for a Government of India undertaking called the National Thermal Power Corporation, which generates thermal power in suburban, remote parts of India. Some of these are disturbed places like the Indochina border. Even in normal conditions, it's very difficult to provide health care. And on the lower right-hand slide, this almost looks like a NASA Space Mission Center or an ISRO. Sorry, I shouldn't say NASA. I should, I should say ISRO because the Indian Space Research Organization is as good as NASA so far as uh, uh, space exploration is concerned. This is the Apollo Telehealth Services COVID Center, which you can see. My staff are here looking at this. And in real time, we are able to find out how a ventilator functions and not. So this is what we have been doing in the last two weeks. I've always I've been giving hundreds of talks on telehealth for the last 20 years. For the last 10 years, I have been telling that telehealth in any country, let alone India, will never really take off. It will not get that critical mass so essential for us to really take off unless there is political will. It is sad that a strand of RNA has totally changed the world. India right now is going through the second wave, but the last couple of days, the numbers are falling down. And we think in another two weeks or so, we will come back to what we were at least a few months ago. The Prime Minister of India, in every single uh, talk he has addressed to the nation, he again and again urges doctors to offer telemedicine services. And this has really picked up. It's I don't know. I have no words to express what I'm saying. You can just see in every single day, every single newspaper throughout the length and breadth of India, this is what you find. The government, the administration, Every stakeholder of the healthcare ecosystem has at last realized, accepted that social distancing is here to stay. Today, ladies and gentlemen, information and communication technology is as important as oxygen and hospital beds. 
Indian healthcare is becoming digital. I belong to the BC era. I'm not talking of before Corona. I'm talking of before computers. I was the last group of neurosurgeons in India trained in 75 when there was no computers at all in the field of healthcare. In the last 45 years, particularly in the last one to two years, the phenomenal growth in bridging the urban rural health divide is unbelievable. I'm sure that in my lifetime, I'm going to see a hospital in your pocket a doctor in your pocket, a laboratory in your pocket. Distance has become meaningless and geography has become history. I'm fastidious about time and I hope I've stuck to the time. Thank you once again for giving me this opportunity. I'd be very happy to take questions at the appropriate time. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Professor Ganapathy. I think you've, you've made us all feel fantastically positive about the potential of... Oh, I, have one, I have one more slide. And of course, it's it's uh, it's obvious. I don't have to mention it. You can ignore reality, but you cannot ignore the consequences of ignoring reality. And I think the Ten Commandments. If Moses was here, he will say, "Thou shalt digitally transform." Commandment number one, commandment number two, and commandment number ten. Thou shalt digitally transform. Thank you. Um, on, on that point, I know we have questions in the chat. We have some quite specific questions and we'll have questions from our front row. But just before the front row have the opportunity um, to come in and, and ask their questions, I'd like to ask um, a slightly more general question for Professor Ganapathy and for Mark. But if we go first to the professor. And the question is about, you mentioned the importance of prevention of bringing citizens with you, of citizen empowerment, uh, patient empowerment. And I'm just wondering, uh, do you sense in, in India from your experience now, are citizens also a very part of driving the change towards digital options? I'm, I'm thinking particularly about the, the use of telemedicine. Um, yeah. And for both of you, you have a complex health and care staff network and citizens who are involved in these developments at all times, but just particularly on the citizens, are people positive, are they willing, or is it an uphill struggle? Do I take that question first? Yes, please, Professor Ganapathy okay. first. Yeah. yeah, the first 10 years, 12 years of my life as a telemedicine evangelist was spent in creating an awareness in trying to persuade people, and it was an uphill task. But five to six years ago, it's, things started slowly changing. But believe me, what we were unable to achieve in the last 19, 20 years, a strand of RNA has been able to do it. Now it is a question of necessity. There's no choice anymore. And now with lockdowns, partial lockdowns, with so many restrictions, etc., etc., people have realized that, and I'm sure this is not a knee-jerk reaction. This is not something forced on them. Yes, it is forced on them today. But the indications are, after all, the pandemic is not going to be there for the rest of our life, maybe three months, maybe six months, maybe one year. But once we come back to at least somewhat the semblance of our original life, I'm very confident that remote healthcare will be an integral part of the healthcare system because people have realized by out of necessity, they have realized the advantages of doing a consultation sitting from your home. Could I have imagined that sitting from my flat in Chennai, I'm able to talk to all of you. In 45 minutes from now, I'm going to Washington, D.C. I mean, this is something which could never even have thought about it. So I'm absolutely confident that we no longer have to drive. We no longer have to force people to do telemedicine. The, I'm sure that in my lifetime, the stage will come where patients are going to demand telemedicine, and every CEO of a hospital, instead of placing orders for an intraoperative MRI or a cath lab, he is going to place orders for telemedicine equipment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, great answer. Mark, if I could just turn to you also, just on the point really about citizen engagement and empowerment. It may be we're reaching a point where the citizens are well ahead of the politicians and some of the other senior stakeholders. But Mark, what's your experience been? I think as, as we become more comfortable across the age groups using video to keep in touch with our, our siblings, our grandparents, our grandchildren, and, and as video becomes a choice, an option for people to choose. So they don't have to travel. They don't have to take time off work. They don't have to find childcare. 
And, and I think when you're presented by a, a service that doesn't offer video, I think the public are going to be asking, why can I not have that? And, and, I, and hopefully we'll, we'll be, I think we'll be approaching that very soon, uh, not just around the pandemic. I think the pandemic has accelerated everything, um, but it's now shown you what, what the possibilities are. And we've got a window of opportunity, I think, to try and bring the public along and clinicians before everyone throws their doors open and tries to get everybody back into buildings. But I, I don't see how that's going to happen because there's a, a backlog of patients that haven't been seen for maybe a year that need, that need our help. But there's also a group of patients who we don't even know yet. They haven't presented to us yet. We don't know what those needs are and, and how we're going to meet those. So how do how we physically get all those through outpatient appointment departments when we could be screening? We could be doing um, preoperative assessments on video. So, so I think we, we have got a, a window of opportunity here with, with the public and the clinicians to, to seize this and, and embed it so it becomes part of what is the offer to people to make a choice from. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Thank you both very much. Um, I'll just check in with Diane to keep me on the straight and narrow. Um, so we're going to go to the front row for questions now, Diane. Is that okay? Yeah, I know yeah, we have fine. Questions. Absolutely. I think we're starting with Elisabetta Grabs uh, from Puglia. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Diane. Um, I, if I could, um, uh, I have a question uh, for the two previous uh, 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 relators. Um, can I ask you, uh, how long did it take to develop this impressive architecture, uh, both in India and in Scotland? Because uh, um, uh, it, the, the time is very important at the moment. So I wonder how long did it take to, to develop these models? Necessity is the mother of invention. And two, the way things are now happening in India, particularly, we have just no time, absolutely no time. So this is a most unusual. I don't think we'll ever see this in, I don't know, for how many hundred years or whatever it is. So just to give you an example, we have been able, and when I say we, I mean the division with which I'm associated with, the telehealth division of the Apollo Hospital Group. We have been able to put up, as I showed you in one of the photographs, in 10 days, we have been able to put up a semi-structured, a ready to use, uh, a COVID ready exclusively for COVID, a, a state-of-the-art intensive care unit with ventilators, laboratory, that, this, oxygen, et cetera, et cetera. So because we have not just even 10 days is too much. We wish we could do it even smaller than this. Now that is this extraordinary situation. But normally for my other public-private partnerships, it takes me about three months to do the need assessment study. One of the reasons why we have been very successful is we go to the remotest part where the government wants us to do a study and we refuse to take up any project unless we go talk to the people, we talk to the end user, we, and we make the end user the champion. We recruit people from the towns and villages. That is the most important thing. So it takes three months for us to formulate a plan and maybe another month to two months to get it approved and another two to three months to actually put the infrastructure. But between six to nine months, we are ready uh, to become fully operational. And as with more and more and more experience, then the number of months it takes becomes less and less. And luckily, the red tapeism, the bureaucracy, etc., cetera, particularly because of the pandemic times is becoming far less than before. So the answer to your question, madam, is on an average, three to six months, but on an extraordinary situation, even two to three weeks. Thank you very much. It's really impressive. Yeah, and I, and I suppose in Scotland, um, it was amazing. I've been using Near Me for some time prior to COVID, and we achieved more in the first three months of, of 2020 than we'd done the previous two years. So between March, between March and October, we went from 300 to 22,000 a week. And a lot of that was down to all the red tape disappeared. Oh, if you need that, you can have it. If you want to do that, yes, go ahead and do it. It was amazing how the bureaucracy just fell away and we could we could be agile. We could be innovative. We, it was a license to let's really do something that's going to make a difference here. And, and one of the biggest barriers that's come through the reviews we've done around near me has has been clinicians willingness to engage. 
in, in something new, something a bit challenging, something a bit different. And sometimes people are reluctant to, to embrace that. But when they were thrown into a pandemic, they're like, I've got to use this now because I have, to, I have a service to provide. And that went a long way in accelerating people's willingness uh, to, to embrace it and, and give it a go. And once folk had given it a go, and actually, it's really easy to use, quite straightforward. You know, I don't know what the fuss was about. So that would be our experience in Scotland. Thank you very much. And how Mary has it been in Puglia? Have you had similar experiences? Uh, yes, really um, not so impressive, really. But we are, um, I would like to share with you um, the experience of the Fudianet uh, project, which is a, a little example of uh, hybrid care, you know. Um, and uh, it was planned before uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis. Uh, um, because um, it, um, it's a project funded um, by Ministry of Health uh, in the framework of the national program of the National Center for Disease and Prevention Control. Um, it involves uh, five Italian regions, uh, and, um, including Puglia, and uh, RS has been leading uh, the consortium now. Um, and the, the project addressed the, the, the target population of diabetic people. So uh, we talk about uh, chronicity and um, people over 40 years old, uh, fostering both uh, integrated care approach and uh, task shifting on uh, food literacy and um, correct lifestyle promotion. Uh, thanks to a specific protocol we developed in um, in the project, uh, uh, delivered by a platform, a web-based platform, the Puglia platform, which is now available at uh, the address foodianet.com. Um, and the protocol consists in um, of face-to-face -face meetings uh, at the beginning and uh, at the end uh, of the protocol. And uh, in the middle time, in the middle period, lasting about four weeks, um, during which patients can access uh, tailored contents on the platform, um, they can also carry out empowerment exercises and uh, interact with uh, educators uh, by asynchronous messages. And uh, this going through three different teaching paths related to three levels of um, patient expertise, um, which were uh, preliminary as, uh, assessed at the baseline. Um, tailored contents and uh, exercises can be delivered because uh, uh, patients at the beginning of the protocol can assess by their own uh, their level of food literacy and, uh, and empowerment at, at baseline. And uh, they can do so um, by a questionnaire, uh, the me and my diabetes questionnaire, uh, we developed in the project uh, and um, uh, we validated it in, in the project. Face-to-face um, uh, -face meetings are useful because at the beginning to, uh, to perform a sort of counseling and to raise awareness and also to select people uh, um, to, to join the protocol. Uh, while at the end, uh, a new assessment and, and a new face-to-face -face encounter is needed to discuss uh, uh, results uh, with the patients and uh, to pass through an upper level, um, an upper level protocol if it, this is possible. Um, then we tried also to to transfer rapidly this approach, um, elaborating a sort of um, a cascade model for training. Um, this also to sustain uh, protocol dissemination. In fact, we trained a group of um, uh, 15 professionals, basically GPs and um, diabetologists, and the second group of um, 10 task shifties, nurses, dietitians, psychologists, and also expert patients. Um, uh, Try to encourage them to, to, to plan additional training sessions and to act really 
a sort of task, task shifting uh, uh, about the protocol among their colleagues. Um, we also trying to, to nudge adherence and uh, compliance. We, we also linked uh, to continuous education learning uh, credits for professional uh, these uh, training sessions. And we also developed a sort of register for educators on the platform. Um, and this register, they will, they will be implemented proportionally to the cascade training uh, on the protocol by the organization that will disseminate the protocol. Um, we also performed preliminary dissemination activities and these, uh, it was real uh, useful because uh, uh, we create awareness in Puglia about uh, uh, this kind of hybrid care and um, a multidisciplinary group uh, of professionals chose to join the project uh, um, and start training uh, um, uh, on the protocol and also uh, on the platform. Uh, it's um, a sort of uh, um, initial um, attempt to uh, to redesign uh, uh, new pathways, but uh, at the moment in Puglia we have uh, um, eighteen about eighteen patients enrolled on the path on the platform, and um, totally in Italy uh, forty five patients. But we are we are going on, and we we will uh, try to monitor the results. Thank you. Mark, on your side, uh, Scotland is a national health service. Um, how, how was Near Me funded and where did, where did the organisational change come from? Um, well that, Near Me has been kind of working in Scotland since probably 2016. So I think initially it was, it was done as a pilot. Nessa might have to be right on this because she may have been around. I've been in the team since October last year. So... But in terms of uh, its procurement and funding, that's done by central government. So initially it was funded for the NHS only. And then from for a number of up until 2022 at the minute. But it's recently been rolled out so that we're now accepting applications for waiting areas for a near me waiting area from anybody within the public services. So if you're a voluntary organisation, a housing association, a citizens advice bureau, a local authority or a council so so it's been broadened out but it's been centrally funded by the scottish government uh, with support of that i'd just add in it's nessa here um uh, yes mark i've been around for a long time <laughs> I didn't that's mean polite, that. <laughs> that's the polite way of putting it. Um, but just in terms of Scottish funding, as Mark says, obviously it's it's uh, nationally funded, centrally funded, and there's no we don't have to deal with issues around reimbursement. Um, so that's probably a major factor of difference for some of the healthcare systems um, that are in operation. So it's it's funded as part of um, our digital health and care. Um, activity essentially um, and the rollout and scale up had been happening for many years even prior to the launch of near me in 2016 we had been using and trialing um, video conferencing as a solution in a number of small areas particularly focusing on remote and rural at the time um, but gradually trying to build those knit them together into a national service um, there's a lot of concern in Scotland um, or there has been certainly a lot of concern that we would end up with multiple different types of video conferencing solutions that couldn't be centrally supported and may or may not join up with the national plan. Um, um, so there was eventually there was an agreement in 2016 to go with the national rollout. And from there, it's been building slowly until last year, as Mark said. And I would also add alongside funding of near me as a digital platform there's also been help for services to purchase things like webcams and extra screens and microphones and headsets because without that hardware you, you can't provide the service so it's been a massive investment i have to say but also we've been also investing in our in our citizens so a lot of people in scotland don't have good broadband they perhaps don't have devices they perhaps don't live in a place where they can access the kind of digital things that, that you and I might take for granted. So Connecting Scotland is looking at trying to make sure that citizens can make that choice. If I want a video call, I've either got a device or I've got broadband, or I can go somewhere locally, like my library or my village hall, where I can meet somebody and, and have some help with a device 
or have some help to get online. <clears throat> so we're tackling it that way as well as just from the clinician side of things too. I, I, I'd just like to be quite opportunistic there and ask Liz um, Methanius from Greece to hop in there. Um, simply because of your interest in older adults and perhaps things like community available equipment. Maybe you've got a, a reflection on that, Elizabeth. And we'll come then back to our three. Uh, that I think George Dafoulis is on this and he's a doctor and he's very interested in e-health. So I'm sure he will back me up or add some more stuff because uh, we, we kind of, vaguely work together as far as we can. Just to say, Greece went through 10 years of hell on the economic crisis. It led to huge cutbacks in personnel, funding, and so on. We've had, we had a new government more than a year ago. We get beginning to get digitalized, if one may use it in that way. Um, but of course, uh, we as an NGO have been a lot of stuff in trying to get people trained, but we're a small NGO. I mean, there's a limit to how much you can do. And the um, infrastructure that Mark talks about, cameras and uh, things, I, I think absolutely they're needed and they don't exist at the moment. They could be done, but local authorities don't have that kind of funding. Uh, we have community centers for older people. It would be quite simple in one level to do that, but we don't. They, older people are not on the priority list, though they're beginning to appear, uh, partly because we spend so little on long-term care that it's getting to be at crisis point. And when everything shut down, we had to have help at home systems expand to deal with older people and nobody to help them. And they did that. Um, obviously, that has to happen at the local level. So, I, I mean, I think there is an opportunity. I think sensitizing government, any government, to the issue of older people who are the ones most likely to need uh, health care and um, preventative care and all those things which people have talked about. It's been a very interesting session, and I don't say that lightly. I, <laughs> I haven't listened into too many. But I found the, uh, the variety of approaches interesting. We all have our own structural problems to deal with. George, are you there? Do you want to say anything that I haven't said? Because he's, he works with a local authority that is very electronically on the ball in Tricola. And I wondered if he'd got something to say. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Liz. Uh, I totally agree with you, and the, especially the comment you made for my colleagues, the clinicians. <laughs> uh, they, when they, they, they're they not very fond of uh, blended care because they lose the fee for, for, uh, for service uh, business model there is now in Greece. And unless this business model of uh, uh, reimbursement of clinicians change to bundle care or something else, they will not like it because they lose the money from the uh, fee for service. So indeed, uh, it's a challenging issue. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I mean, I think it's better coming from a doctor than coming from me, but I agree with him. <laughs> thank so, you very much indeed for those insights. But the island, and, and I mean, Mark's model of the islands and the remote areas where there's no competition, because people won't go to stay there as doctors, this is a real, it's a perfectly viable man, model, uh, but again, it needs infrastructure spending. Thank you very much. Um, indeed, I was wondering, um, well, first of all, I would like to thank both of the speakers for their interesting talks and initiatives. And uh, Mark, I think that uh, Near Me is a great initiative, uh, but I was wondering, um, New models of care come with evaluation, and that's such a very important thing. And I was wondering if you have any useful insights into evaluating near me. What did you do to evaluate uh, the, the service you provide? Uh, yeah, good question. We've had two independent evaluations carried out by Oxford University, uh, one last summer and then one uh, that was published uh, in March this year. I'll put the links up to them within the chat, if that's helpful. Um, so it's been fully evaluated and, and from there, recommendations were made 
Um, the latest recommendations were very much around uh, scale up and roll out, particularly in primary care. There was lots of recommendations around leveling up access to talking about community hubs. So, so the recommendations from the evaluations have very much guided our next six to nine months of work um, uh, around equitable, e equity of access for people. Um, but also making sure that, that, the, that the, the primary care. So we're doing lots of work with primary care at the minute. So I'm doing work with um, the receptionists and the admin staff within primary care. So the conversation they have with people phoning to see their general practitioner, then, then the choice around phone, video, face to face is at the very beginning rather than later on. I was just wondering because uh, uh, the reason I'm so interested into evaluation is that um, when you start with a new model of care, the evaluation is very important. For instance, if you want to get reimbursement for the hospital care you provide, for the other care you provide. Um, so, and I'm the project leader of NWE Chance, and it's a project that is focused on hospitalizations at home. And that's a rather new concept. So it's very important also for us to evaluate and uh, we will evaluate our uh, pilots we conduct at this moment next year. So in uh, in that respect, I was wondering, well, what did other um, uh, people use that also introduced new models of care? So thank you very much. Astrid, that's I, great. Actually, I mean, Nessa, I would have thought you might have pointed at this, that the iHub, the improvement hub in, in Scotland, actually has a very um, extensive section on evaluating new models of care. Um, and uh, and it's, a, it's quite a nice summary, I think, Astrid, if you want to see the sorts of techniques that the Scottish people think about using. Yep, you're ahead of me, Stuart. I was just literally just copying the URL and <laughs> putting it into the chat, but yeah go for Great. it and the Good. the team okay. should say I, I don't know if mark if you said this you probably did but the team for the improvement hub or the ihub um in scotland also participated in the rapid scale up they were very much part of that whole qi approach so members of that team and the technology team and the team who'd been involved in the rollout already came together to kind of expand a team with different skill sets um to support the rollout so so yes, they've been they were key last year and and are now engaging again this year. Thank you for that. Great, great to hear what the methods have been and where the expertise lies. And I noticed that Elisabetta Gratz from uh, Polia has given us a pointer to health technology assessment. Um, Stuart, um, it, it was great to hear another Scottish voice there. I'm just wondering. Um, I do have a. a final, final question that's come through that will help us wrap up. Um, but given given everything you've seen happen in Scotland and internationally, indeed, wondered whether you had a, a, a pressing question to pose to Mark and to the team. Yeah, I do have a quick question for Mark. I mean, maybe it's a slow question. So, I was trying to kind of map the, the demand that you were meeting, and I, I kind of had three dimensions that I was thinking about. And it seemed to me that you you kind of hit a sweet spot in at least the introductory things that you were talking about, because in a sense, there's a, it's a kind of dimension in terms of how much incentive people have to, to use this, the, the service. And for that, you had COVID and you had uh, and you had remoteness as strong incentives, at least in the pilots. And then you have you have how close it is to clinical, yeah. So so in a sense, you were quite close to clinical in those things. But I think it seems to get tougher as you move more towards integrated care. And then finally, the socioeconomic grouping. And so and it seemed like you, at least in the in the pilots, you described you were sitting in a very nice sweet spot in terms of saying adoption would be strong. And, uh, and and everything was kind of beautiful. So I wondered, so here are the questions I wondered was, how was the reach? Yeah, so how did it go with, with lower socioeconomic groupings? Did What problems do you have and how do you think you should address that? And then in terms of stretching out into, into integrated care and so on, you described having lots of waiting rooms. Well, how do you think about structuring that? Because 
it seems to me that really what you want is a single point of contact, a bit like a one 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 for your service, yeah, where you where you hit the thing and then then it directs you to the individual waiting rooms. And and is that the kind of thing you're thinking about in terms of pulling together and and moving more towards an integrated care situation where the where if you like the segment of demand that you're looking at is much more uh, is a little bit tougher to to reach in some way. So I'll take your first part is the um, uh, the section around socioeconomic impact. So again, uh, that links in with our, our work we're doing with Connecting Scotland and and community access. So that you know we, we we've had we've heard stories of people who've who've like <clears throat> I've got a mobile phone, but I don't have I don't have the money for the bus or. Uh, I, I don't have good broadband. I don't have a device, you know. So, so that that is very much what we're looking at doing. That was a recommendation coming out of the last evaluation. Was how do we enable people who don't have ready access for whatever reason, whether it's a location or social economic, you know? And, and we all we all we all know how much impact COVID has had on people in certain social economic groups who are already disadvantaged from accessing good health, and their outcomes are generally poorer. Than, than other members of the population. And this has been magnified again. So again, we've got this opportunity to try and engage with groups. Um, and it's not just a remote rural, we're having conversations with clinicians who are based in very urban areas where people are isolated within, you know, big blocks of flats. You know, you don't have to be living in a little croft house in the middle of nowhere to be an isolated no, you, person. You, you just have to look at the deep 100 people. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah. so yes, absolutely. So, so how, how do we engage with that group who are, can be hard to reach and can have quite long-term chronic health needs that, that technology hopefully will level some of that playing field. Uh, and again, Stuart, again, I think, I don't think we've reached that, that point where things have leveled out yet. We've still got high uptake. We've still got people aren't allowed to go places. People don't want people in their buildings. And I don't know what percentage the whole telephone, video, face-to-face -face is going to be. Some primary care um, um, staff are talking about kind of a, a rule of thirds almost. A third of people by phone, a third of people by near me, and a third of people face-to-face. -face. But, but we're still in this stage where we don't quite know what the end looks like. So... Um, and again, that sweet spot that that might change. Yes, we, we've got, you know, like you say, that, that that there's a there's a we have to think of something different to do now. And there are there are I mean there's some there's some very honest clinicians that that have said we're just desperate to see patients again. And and as a clinician myself, we we come into our professions because we like being alongside people and making a difference to them. That's what we go to work for. So clinicians are finding it it's a big culture shift for clinicians doing things by video. Uh, some perceive it as being a second class kind of service. And I think until we've done some better evaluations around patient outcomes, your video consultation was as good at, if not better, than seeing you face to face. And pe people are satisfied with videos, but we but we haven't necessarily got to the bottom of the, the, the actual health and well-being outcomes as a result of video call. And that's some work, I think, that needs to be done. People bounce from service to service. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's a big problem. So, for example, your GP, your general practitioner surgery might have a reception waiting area where everyone comes into and a receptionist looks after that reception area and then could move a person through to different waiting areas. They might have another one for the GPs, but, but a person could stay in one waiting area and multiple commissions can come into that waiting area, see that patient, put them back. So the patient stays in the same place, but other people can come in and see them. So, so there is a way of, of making it more efficient. So you know your, your, your citizen dials in once and then they and then the organization and the technology do the logistics if it's that that's that's what we anticipate being used so yes we don't want hundreds of thousands of waiting areas we want an organization to have one and we want them to manage how that patient journeys through that in a way that's easy for the patient indeed i we want to encourage nessa and i um, Solve Sol Wellen from uh, Flanders in Belgium to have a, a last insight. Uh, she was just commenting about the importance of focusing on on people with vulnerabilities. Sol, I see you there. Welcome. I'm there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was so interesting, actually. Uh, you, 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 well, there's a lot of questions, but also a lot of interest in in both uh, both both uh, presentations. Really, very good topics. 
and and I, I I okay I'm not the expert so maybe my questions are, are less relevant but uh, I, I know that when we were in Edinburgh that we were talking also with your colleagues about uh, this kind of an opportunity to that someone can call in and and is referred them to uh, be at a primary care or hospital and we had the same discussion in Flanders and the first thing that came up was like oh but everybody will wonder about the qualifications of this person. Is, is this person someone who can actually do this referring? That's, that's one, that was one element of discussion. And the other one um, is about digital services in general. And uh, I, when we talk about blended care, but also about uh, providing digital services, I know that uh, one of, of, of the discussions in our agency was about can people trust these services and how can we as a government give trust in the services that are provided? So, uh, well, I hope it, it, it's clear. It, my questions are clear, but the, we, we, some, I guess that, that often also we are, we are in, in, in providing, in using, in developing uh, technology services and digital, digital services. We are often confronted with, this, with many ethical issues. And uh, I guess that, that this is also mere the concept why, why Stuart also mentioned, okay, fine, uh, socioeconomic uh, groups, uh, how, how can we just move them on to, to use the digital services? And to me, the, 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 uh, the example from India was, was brilliant. If, but, but you need to put in the, the, the good and the necessary resources. I mean, in terms of, of good practice as a clinician, whether you're on the telephone or whether you're face to face or doing a video then then you have responsibility to to I suppose, convey you know who you are what your job is and 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 your credentials whether we would do that i think no mm -hmm. matter what medium we were using um and and in terms of trusting a digital service i mean you know people are more i think risk aware now around their data and around their information and confidentiality so i suppose in the, in the in speaking about near me specifically that's a very encrypted um, it doesn't remember anything. It doesn't record anything. It's it's not something that other people can join. It's not like a Zoom call or FaceTime. So I think it's been it's been written by the by the people in in uh, in attend anywhere that from from to be used for this as opposed to other platforms that have been designed for something else and then have been used with patients and and there's trying to get all those safeguards in at the end rather than built in at the beginning. So we do have conversations reassuring. I mean, I've done it with families and children where, you know, children have come on and, and spoken to me on the on a video call and, and reassured them this is like, you know, this is NHS kind of FaceTime. This is safe, secure. No one's going to come in. And, you know, you can you can tell me what you'd like to tell me because no one else can can come into this call without our permission. So so there's some of it is around our professional behavior as clinicians using these um, tools. Um, just a couple of reflections, really, from me, and 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 also if I if you can bear with me, some conversations I've been having with some of my Scottish and international colleagues this week about other work and in, in relation to digital health and care, and the things that have have consistently been coming up are how do we talk about the service and how do we talk about the service user? And some people don't even like the term service user. <laughs> um, so my colleagues have advised me we, sh we should talk about people, just people. We are all people after all. So how do I want to access services as a citizen? Um, what's the best option for me? What works for me with my caring responsibilities or my long-term health conditions or my family situation or my geographic situation? What works for me? And then how does the technology actually support me to access these services? And thinking about some of the points Professor Ganapathy made, you know, how can I be a champion? Um, how can the people, the end users, as he put it, be champions for the service? And how can it actually support me to think more about wellness rather than just crisis and think more about prevention rather than just response. Um, so for me, there's been so much richness in the presentations today. And I, I appreciate always with the presenters, it's very difficult to condense what you've done and what you know and what you've experienced into this short, quite short time. Um, and there's so much more to share. But I think ultimately, the, all of these services and the developments and the rapid scale up we've experienced and whether or not they'll really stick, you know, that's the question that we're still we're still grappling with. Let's be honest. We don't really know. 
um, what things are going to be like in two years' time in relation to video consultation or other parts of digital health and care. We hope the learning will be recycled into the system and that we will have um, more integrated services and more options and more accessible services for all of our citizens. Um, and we will have taken more listening from the different sectors of our society about what equity actually means. Um, I mentioned to Diane when we were preparing for today that another point that's come up a lot for us in Scotland in recent months, really, in the last eight to nine months just, has been a point about um, whether digital access is a human right. Um, and that's something that I think is going to influence this whole discussion and debate. Um, and again, referring back to Mark and, and Professor Ganapathy, you know, how much of a driver um, the citizen and their voice is in the way we develop these services. And I think that actually being honest about it makes a lot of people a little bit uncomfortable because they have to actually sit down and open up <laughs> about what can be done, what's affordable and what's achievable and all of those things. So Diane, I will pause there and hand back. Nessa, I, I think it's, it's impossible to conclude in, in in a way that is as inspirational and as focused on uh, really the value of our health and care and the importance of it to people and people's involvement. So although the next slide uh, was indeed a set of uh, a set of wrap ups, uh, they're very much more functional and organizational. That's really been where a lot of our conversation was, at least initially. But then it's really spread out into learning, sharing information, scaling up, speeding up, um, how we organize this, how, how we involve people. So um, it, it's clear in a way that COVID-19 has, has really, is really, because I say it's still in the present tense, it's continuing and continuing in many parts of the globe, is really helping to be a situation that's facilitating very rapid change. But you have said all that perfectly. Mm -hmm.